Hello, and welcome to Breastfeeding 101. On behalf of Oakdale OBGYN, I'm very happy that you're joining us for this hour-long webinar. Um, we've had a lot of interest um, in breastfeeding, and so we're excited to um, bring our content to you. My name is Kristen Smith, and I'm the Outreach Coordinator for Oakdale OBGYN. I'm joined by my technical consultant, Andy Meyer. Andy is helping to kind of run the show and make sure that all is going well. Um, I wanna just cover a few uh, tidbits with regard to uh, how we're gonna handle tonight, questions, that type of thing. And then um, alert you to the fact that handouts, et cetera, are where you can find those. So we'll be handling questions at the end of today's presentation. Um, we're gonna leave about 10 minutes for that. And if we end up going over, that's fine. Um, we'll have the webinar on the website and on our YouTube, YouTube channel starting tomorrow so that you can share it with others, you can rewatch it, you can print out the handouts, et cetera. Um, if you do have a question tonight, if you go to the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A function and a chat function. Just type your question into whichever you prefer and we will um, work through those at the end of the presentation. Um, we're joined by two, uh, two content experts tonight and I'm gonna introduce them one by one and then turn it over to them. Um, Bethany Yelly is a longtime nurse practitioner and her career began as a labor and delivery nurse. She now works at Oakdale OBGYN, thankfully lucky for us. Um, where she works with people who want to have a baby, who have had a baby, and want to know all things about breastfeeding. She also um, sees women for wellness concerns, GYN concerns, etc. It was her idea for uh, having this lactation this lactation presentation because she gets so many questions, and she really thought that doing something like this would be helpful to people. Um, she also was um, the, the ideator for inviting Shelly Wrights, who is a lactation consultant, to join this evening. Um, Shelly is a registered nurse, and she's also a board-certified uh, lactation consultant. She sees patients at or sees women at um, Wellspring Lactation, which is an organization that's dedicated to in-home consults, uh, phone and virtual consults. They have a breastfeeding, uh, breastfeeding support group, et cetera. And really their goal is to help empower women and to nurture babies. Um, we've had a couple of questions come in um, via email to me and I'm gonna move those to the end and we'll address those as we move along. And I think with, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Bethany and she's gonna take it away. Thank you. Well, thanks, Kristen, and I'm glad you guys are all here this evening, um, whether you're watching live or watching on recording. Uh, and yes, I felt like this was an important need uh, in our community. I feel like seeing a lot of um, my pregnant patients, uh, the big question that comes up, um, especially recently, has been related to breastfeeding and uh, a lot of um, just like, what do I do? How do I do it? What's important to know? And I think we spend a lot of time preparing women for labor and birth and that delivery process, but we spend um, very little time preparing for what comes afterwards. And we think about, you know, labor and delivery is actually a really short snippet um, in your life, whereas feeding your baby is something that you're going to be doing um, multiple times a day, sometimes for 20 to 30 minutes at a time, um, and, for, uh, and for a long period of time, not just for a day. So that's kind of what the impetus was for putting this together, and also felt like um, would be just a good opportunity uh, to get some information out there. There is a lot of information out there on the web, you guys, and um, some of it is helpful, and some of it sometimes cannot be helpful. So we wanted to kind of put some factual information together for you guys and hopefully answer some questions as we go along. So first thing is just talking about um, the benefits of breastfeeding. And um, I hate to say, oh, sorry, I kind of skipped ahead. Um, 
I think sometimes we just need to be reminded of why is breastfeeding important? And one of the things that I like to mention for people is that it really is ideal nutrition for your baby. Um, and we think about um, babies that are born prematurely, for example, um, the breast milk that you produce as a mom, um, if your baby is born prematurely is going to be different and the composition is going to be different than if you had had your baby at full term. Um, so your body knows what your baby needs. And so I always feel like with breast milk, you don't have to worry about what's in it. Um, and you can just kind of know that it is gonna be what your baby needs at that certain point in their life. The other thing that we think about with breast um, with breast milk and the benefits of breastfeeding for your baby is it also has some built-in natural antibodies that your baby is going to receive. Um, so for example, if you were to get sick with an illness, like if you get a cold or you get the flu, um, a lot of times you're going to be able to transmit that natural antibodies that your body is producing to your baby to help them to be able to fight off illness and sickness. The other thing we think about is um, for example, the early milk that your body produces, it's something called colostrum, which Shelly will talk about a little bit more. Um, but that early milk is this really thick kind of, we, used to, we call it liquid gold, but it's a very thick substance. And what that is doing in those first few days of life is that is kind of helping to coat your baby's GI tract, getting it ready for the mature milk. Um, so again, it has a lot of um, benefits for your baby. We've seen it reduce the risk of certain illnesses in your baby, such as um, we see a decreased incidence of asthma, um, obesity, type one diabetes, um, a lot of babies that are breastfeed, we can see a reduction in ear infections as well as some um, respiratory disease. And we also see an, a decrease in sudden infant death syndrome. For our premature babies, we see um, a decrease in something called uh, necrolyzing enterocolitis. Um, so that's a very important, that can be something that can be very severe for your premature babies. Um, as well as we see a decrease in some gastrointestinal um, infections, diarrhea, vomiting, those types of things in babies that are getting breastfed. Let's see if my screen will let me click ahead here. Um, next is just kind of benefits for mom and Again, one of the things I like to, to kind of joke about, I have a lot of patients that say, oh, it's great because I'm burning calories. And yes, that is something that when we are breastfeeding, um, we are using up extra calories. And so it does help um, for a lot of us when we're breastfeeding to help to kind of shed some of those pounds that maybe we gained um, while we were pregnant. However, there's other benefits for, for us as moms when we breastfeed, um, we can reduce our risk of higher blood pressure. Um, our bodies when we're breastfeeding uh, produce hormones that actually are, I like to call them the feel-good hormones. Um, they cause us to be kind of a little bit more relaxed. There's actually a hormone out there called relaxin, does exactly what it sounds like it does, um, but it can help to lower our blood pressure. Um, we've seen it um, reduce our risk for developing type 2 diabetes later, as well as arthritis, um, certain types of cancers such as ovarian cancer um, and breast cancer. We can see a reduced risk for those moms who have been breastfeeding. The other nice thing is that um, it can kind of pause ovulation and delay when you might get your period back. So that might naturally space pregnancies. Now I promise you though, ladies, um, at your six week postpartum checkup, we're gonna be talking about uh, postpartum contraception because breastfeeding does not guarantee that um, you can't get pregnant. Um, but again, sometimes we can see a nice pause in um, our normal menstrual cycle while we are breastfeeding, which is kind of nice, a little bit of a nice break. Um, other benefits that we see, some of you um, know the ease of use, right? It's always available. Uh, you don't have to heat it up. Uh, you don't have to uh, put it into a bottle. It's always ready to go. Um, it does not cost anything. Uh, I have had several moms recently um, express concern um, and feeling like they need to breastfeed because they're concerned about formula shortages and things like that. Um, and that is actually a very real factor right now. Uh, so that's something that it's, you know, again, easy to use um, and it's always going to be available for you. So, um, and I always joke too that, you know, in the middle of the night, sometimes we just don't want to have to like deal with warming up a bottle and just easy to be able to nurse a baby right from the get-go. Other things that we think about with preparing to breastfeed, um, 
we think about supplies. And so that's one of the questions that I'll get. We talk about um, what do you need? What do you need in order to be successful at breastfeeding? And one of the things that I will tell a lot of our patients is you do want a good fitting um, nursing bra. And the best time to get fitted for this is actually going to be when you're pregnant to wait until you're almost like eight, nine months pregnant. And that's just because um, we see that your kind of your band size, your cup size is going to change. And so you want to wait to buy some of those nursing bras that should be some of the last purchases of pregnancy, if that makes sense, just to make sure that you get a good fit. Um, other things that people find helpful, we think about getting like, a, you know, having a lot of pillows or a breastfeeding pillow. Shelly's got an example she's going to show. We have, we have, there's all sorts of ones on the market. I do like the one, uh, I think is that the My Breast Friend one, Shelly. <laughs> we kind of a catchy name, My Breast Friend. Um, I actually do like the ones that kind of support um, around the back. If you saw that it has that strap kind of around the back, just because um, one of the things that we see for poor moms is um, your back gets so tight and you're tense. Um, and so sometimes having that back support is going to be helpful. Um, you don't need a necessarily a breastfeeding pillow, but having one um, or having a lot of pillows to kind of support you, especially in those early days of breastfeeding is going to be helpful. Breast pads, it's something else that you can, you know, add to your, uh, maybe to your registry list, um, whether or not you use the disposable breast pads or the reusable. The important thing is, is to make sure that you're changing them out frequently, um, just because again, if they get really wet, uh, that can lead to breast infections and things like that. So you want to have breast pads um, and you want to change them out frequently. Um, I know I was somebody who liked to have both the reusable ones as well as the disposable ones uh, for some convenience at times. Uh, other things in your house or apartment, having a comfortable place where you can um, sit or lay back so that you're relaxed while you're nursing or pumping um, and having like a little nest, making sure that you have your water bottle right by you because I promise you, you'll be very thirsty the moment you either start to pump or the moment you start to breastfeed. Uh, we'll get more into pumps in just a little bit, but um, uh, there's a lot of pumps on the market, so we'll talk about some of them, but having a pump, uh, having bottles uh, to be able to um, store your milk in, some storage containers. Again, there's a lot out on the market, and sometimes it's a little bit of trial and error with bottles as far as what your baby may or may not take. Um, and Shelly will get a little bit more into like when is the best time to introduce that bottle. But again, those are just some kind of general supplies that are good to have um, when starting off uh, with breastfeeding. Right. Next, we think about nutrition. And you guys, a lot of you will come and ask me when, um, when you're pregnant, and we care a lot about our nutrition and what we're eating when we're pregnant. I will tell you, it is just as important, if not more important, to focus on our nutrition when we are breastfeeding. Um, we really it, it is of utmost importance. And I, I forgot to add this part to the slide, but the big thing that should be on there first and foremost too is hydration, making sure that we're drinking lots and lots of water. Um, we think about making sure we're getting enough fruits and vegetables. Um, with vegetables, we think about trying to get like those green, um, dark green leafy vegetables in as well as um, kind of uh, some beans, uh, red and orange vegetables. Um, kind of if you think about getting the big color spectrum in there, uh, fruits, trying to do a lot of whole fruits. Um, you want to make sure that you are getting grains in, um, at least half of which are whole grains. Um, dairy, does not, it's okay if we're lactose free. Um, in our family, we are. So there's other additional um, sources where we're getting that calcium for, uh, whether that's going to be your like soy, uh, your kind of your yogurt alternatives, your almond milk. Um, and then again, the yogurt, different things like that, you're going to want to make sure that you're getting in. Protein is hugely important as well, regardless of whether or not um, you eat meat. There's other options out there, uh, scrambled eggs, uh, hard boiled eggs, getting in those beans, peas, lentils, um, seafood, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then having those good oils, avoiding your fried foods. Um, and we think about, um, again, just trying to avoid those fatty fried foods, but other sources of good fatty oils and even like good fats, like your avocados. That's one of my favorite things to eat. So again, just like when we were pregnant nutrition was important. When we are breastfeeding, it is also a, a big thing to focus on. 
And sometimes we're not as good when we're breastfeeding um, about eating because we're tired and we're thinking about our baby. Um, and so making sure you even have like some meals um, stocked in your freezer or some quick kind of grab and go snacks that are gonna be healthy. Um, I always joke uh, these days with COVID, um, if people were gonna come over that their en entrance to see your baby was that they bring you a meal or they drop off a meal for you. So you're just not having to think about it, especially in those first few weeks of breastfeeding. So. We also think about with our nutrition, um, we talk about when we're pregnant needing an additional, you know, about two to 300 calories per day when we're pregnant to sustain a healthy pregnancy, but we even need more when we're breastfeeding or when we're pumping. Um, and a lot of women are, that I know are exclusively pumping and um, giving their baby breast milk. And you guys, you need that ex those extra calories as well when you are lactating. Um, again, back to the water, you can never have enough water. I want you to continue to take your prenatal vitamins. They do make postnatal vitamins out there. Uh, Shelly might have a different opinion, I don't know, but um, I think some of that's a little bit maybe marketing ploy. I just say, if you still have a prenatal vitamin, keep taking that. You don't need to buy a specific postnatal vitamin unless um, you're feeling like you're having some deficiency in other areas. Um, those of you that maybe follow a vegan diet, you might need some extra specifically, like we think of like B12 um, might be, um, you might need an extra supplement of that iron um, in pregnancy. And then with lactation, we kind of have an increased need for um, iodine and as well as um, choline. And so those are things that you can get um, in dairy products and eggs, seafood, that's where you're going to find the iodine. You're also going to find um, choline in like dairy and protein. So um, just some things to think about when you're looking at maybe doing some meal planning. We get a lot of questions about, um, I'm gonna skip over fish for just a second, caffeine. Can you drink caffeine um, when you're pregnant? The answer is yes, in small moderation. Can you then drink caffeine when um, you are breastfeeding? And the answer is yes. Again, usually um, all things in small quantities, but one to two cups of coffee, um, per day is usually not gonna affect your baby. You definitely wanna watch your baby to look for signs of like jitteriness or um, irritability or poor sleeping. But most of the time, if you've been drinking a little bit of caffeine during your pregnancy, um, you can continue to do so um, when you are breastfeeding. So just again, maybe as long as your serving is not a triple espresso, we should be in good shape. Um, alcohol, that's another thing that we get is, can I have a glass of wine um, when I am breastfeeding? And we think about, you know, good rule of thumb is obviously um, completely avoiding alcohol is best. However, uh, again, all things in moderation, we find that um, having one drink a day is not known to be harmful to your infant, um, especially if you're waiting at least two hours before you breastfeed. Um, and the recommendation really is if you are going to be having more than one drink that you need to do what's called pump and dump um, for that next feeding just uh, just to be safe. But um, again, we also want to think about that, you know, the more alcohol we have that can also, um, you know, affect our judgment and maybe to be able to safely care for our baby. So again, all things in moderation and being responsible um, is important. With fish, um, just as in pregnancy, uh, we talk about like healthy seafood. So we, I used to laugh, I used to feel like it was like a Dr. Seuss thing, like um, good fish, bad fish, uh, best fish, something like that. Uh, so we think about, you can have um, kind of several portions, two to three servings of fish a week from um, what we could think about the best or the good options. And um, if you're living here in the Midwest, uh, honestly, especially here in Minnesota, for example, a lot of the bad fish, we're not gonna necessarily get like shark and swordfish, but the, the, good, um, the good fish such as salmon and the tilapia, those types of things, um, you can have two to three servings of a week. And we think about those good fatty acids and um, fatty oils that are in fish, um, healthy and good for babies' brain development. So, okay, so that is nutrition. And then we're gonna talk about breast bumps. I wish we could have a whole class like for you guys and set up with like tons of pumps and that we are here hands on so you could like, you know, see them, touch them, try turning them on, see how they work because this is such um, a, a question that I get a lot of, what do I do about um, breast pumps and what kind of breast pump should I get? 
And it is an important part as we're thinking about getting ready to breastfeed is what kind of what kind of pump that's if that's something that you want to do long term. Um, having a breast pump pump can be very helpful. There's lots of reasons that women will um, get a breast pump uh, again, obviously, to stimulate that supply if you're separated from baby after birth. If you have a premature baby, a lot of our neonatologists will recommend um, pumping, even if somebody's not planning on breastfeeding long term, they will encourage you to pump even if just for a short term so that baby gets those good built in antibodies that we were talking about earlier. Um, as far as uh, it can also stimulate and increase supply if you feel like you have a low milk supply, and we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. Um, when you go back to work or school um, to try and maintain your supply, that is going to be important to have a breast pump. And I also have a lot of women who are choosing to exclusively pump and then feed their baby breast milk through a bottle. And that has become um, another really popular option. And you guys, that's just as important too, to know um, that all those things that we talked about, nutrition and adequate hydration and sleep, all of those things are important, regardless of if baby is nursing at the breast, getting breast milk, or you are pumping and providing that milk. You are still providing them that nutrition and you need to focus on your nutrition as well. Um, when you are thinking about getting a breast pump, there's just a couple of things that Shelly and I had come up with of just things that are helpful. Um, one is if you're going to be exclusively pumping and bottle feeding, certainly you wanna have the capability of double pumping. Um, to be able to pump both your breasts at the same time uh, is definitely a time saver. And you're gonna find that uh, you're gonna be able to get more of a milk supply established. Um, having something that is where you have like an electric or battery operated option so that maybe you can, um, pump on the go uh, and you're not having to worry about plugging it into a, uh, like an electric source. Um, we think about warranty. A lot of them will have um, a warranty up to two years and that to me kind of shows how reliable it is, but checking to see what's the warranty coverage on it. Uh, some will come with at least two different size flanges, which I'll show you a slide of that in just a minute. Um, so having some different sizes, some accessories, some come with like a hands-free attachment set, some will come with a cooler, some will come with bottles. So just kind of seeing what, what each pump has for its option. And then a really big one um, is to check with your insurance company for coverage. I've been really happy and impressed that more and more insurance companies are reimbursing for breast pumps um, because they are expensive. Uh, and yet I think super important for people to have, especially if they want to have um, a successful breastfeeding journey and maybe even wanting to be able to pump um, you know, for a year or two, um, having, having that ability to give your baby breast milk for that long is great. So check with your insurance company. That's part of your homework. Um, so oh, I gotta go back, skipped ahead too much. Um, with the various different pumps, you guys, there is, there's almost too many options. We were talking about this earlier. Uh, the first one I mentioned is the hospital grade double electric pump. This is going to be the ones that are available. Like if you deliver here at Maple Grove Hospital, these are actually in all of your postpartum rooms. And so I actually tell people, you can leave if you have your breast pump already, you can leave it at home. If you need to start pumping in the hospital, they will provide you with uh, an accessory kit um, so that you can use the hospital grade double electric pump that's in your room. So you don't necessarily need to worry about bringing your pump with you. Um, this is gonna be the best way to get a good supply initiated, especially if you are separated from your baby. So if your baby can't breastfeed right away, um, if they're in the NICU, if they're having difficulty breastfeeding, um, this is going to be what you're going to want to get started on while you're in the hospital just to build up that good milk supply. Um, relatively, the ones that the hospital has, um, and I would say this is fairly standard, are going to be like the Medela um, uh, hospital grade double electric pumps. Another brand out there is Amida. Um, some people can rent these. Uh, it would be very expensive to purchase these on your own, but they do have um, this as a rental option from uh, like a medical supply company. You could rent a hospital grade double electric pump. Uh, and again, I, I've had friends that have used this, especially if they have premature babies, they actually go ahead and rent a pump. And that's usually a little bit more of a feasible way to go about and doing it as opposed to buying it. And typically you should be able to pump uh, for 15 minutes and that's gonna be enough time to get that good milk supply. 
The next one, this is probably more your common one out there is gonna be your double electric uh, strong battery pump. They do vary in strength. Um, some aren't as, some are actually as strong as the hospital grade pump, but they're not gonna be labeled that way. They're not gonna advertise it that way. Um, and this again, it's gonna be able, where you should be able to pump both your breasts and be done in like 15 to 20 minutes. Um, again, lots of brands out there, Medela, Amita, Spectra, um, you guys can see that Lance and all. Um, sometimes, you know, it can be personal preference. I've had some moms uh, start with one brand for one pregnancy and one pump, and then um, the next pregnancy, they decide to switch for whatever reason. So um, it can be a very personal choice. Um, but again, this is, this is a great, these are great pumps for being able to maintain a supply when you're away from your baby, when you go back to work, uh, if you're going back to school, those types of things. Um, the other one we think about is there are double electric um, kind of battery, they're smaller pumps. They're not as strong as the regular double electrics. Um, might take a little bit longer uh, to be able to get the, the milk. Um, so you might be pumping more like at least 20 minutes um, as opposed to that 15 minutes. Um, and if you are exclusively pumping and bottling, this might not be as ideal just because um, you might not have as good, your supply might decrease if you're using just a smaller pump. Um, again, still a reasonable option, especially um, if maybe you're not planning on having to build up a, a milk supply or you're not exclusively pumping and bottling. The other one that we joke about, and this is a lovely picture that you see uh, with the mom on her cell phone, uh, she's multitasking while she is pumping. So they're also the double electric, the kind of the battery operated, their hands free sets. Um, you can kind of pretty much pump wherever. Uh, and sometimes this one's a little bit more noticeable. There's some other ones uh, like the LV brand where you can even kind of like tuck it in your shirt and people don't even know that you're pumping. It's kind of crazy. Um, you can even program them to start when you're ready. So, I mean, you just like pump ahead of time, you know, it can be like hanging out maybe if you're on a, you know, work call or something like that. You just slip it in. Nobody knows that you're pumping. Um, a lot of moms uh, that I know if they work shifts where they're working longer shifts and have a longer drive home, um, they will pump while they're driving. I know, just make sure you're kind of, before you do that, make sure that you're really familiar with how your pump works before you um, are pumping while driving. Hopefully that wouldn't be like a distracted driving type of situation. Uh, but common brands out there are gonna be, uh, for example, Willow and LV. Um, sometimes these are gonna be a little bit more expensive. Um, I had somebody ask what, they thought the best option would be if they were going to buy a pump and um, again, individual options, but I think having a good double electric, like your standard pump that we just talked about, um, that's going to help establish that milk supply, having a good double electric pump is going to be preferable. And then if you're feeling good and breastfeeding is going well, and after a couple months, you're like, you know what, I might want something that has the ability to um, be hands free or to spend that little extra money to have that, um, then reasonable to do that extra investment. But um, I just would hate for somebody to, to do that and then feel like it, it wasn't working for them. So uh, but again, common brands, Willow and LV. And then my other my next next two that I laugh about is the single pump, which I have a good friend that she had the best milk supply ever with just a single pump. Um, but again, it is more of a convenience if you are just needing to be away from home for a little bit of time. It's going to take a little longer to um, pump both sides because you can only do one at a time. So total time of maybe 20 to 30 minutes um, and more of just yeah, if you're just gonna be kind of occasionally out and not needing to necessarily maintain a milk supply, these single pumps are reasonable. They're not terribly expensive. Um, and the Medela Harmony as well as the LV Curve are the examples of two, two brands that are pretty popular right now. Uh, yeah, if you're running an errand, sometimes this can be nice too, just out for a little bit. Uh, the other one that is out there, and Shelly's got this too, is the Haka type pump. Um, these are going to be these soft silicone kind of one piece pump that you literally um, attach to your other breast. And yeah, it's super flexible. You can kind of see how that works. And it, you apply it to the opposite breast while you're breastfeeding from the other side. So it is just going to be used. It's just going to collect that milk from the other side while you are nursing on the opposite side. So it's nice to. Um, 
kind of be able to collect that extra milk and super easy and convenient. Again, I wouldn't use these for, um, for like trying to build up a milk supply, but again, nice way to be able to have pump that other breast um, without you really having to do anything. So um, those are pumps. And again, ask questions. If you think of them, jot them down um, and we'll try our best to answer them at the end. Uh, the other thing that is important when we're um, looking to breastfeed uh, and especially related to pumps, and this is having that proper um, breast flange fit. Uh, so I talked about sometimes most pumps will come with like two standard sizes, um, but having the correct fit is hugely important. We will see a lot of women here in the clinic um, that are having a lot of pain with breastfeeding or pain with pumping. Um, we'll see some skin breakdown. We can see some blistering and some of it can be related to the incorrect flange size. And so what you want to do is you want to start with the flange size that is just slightly wider than the base of your nipple. And when you are pumping, how you're going to know that you have a good fit is that your nipple is going to be moving freely in the tunnel and it's not rubbing against the side. So you kind of see that picture um, and, and you shouldn't see, um, you shouldn't have like pain when you're pumping. Um, so if you're having a lot of pain with pumping, it may be that you just, the, the flange isn't fitting correctly and you may need either a smaller size flange or a larger size, fan, size flange. You are able to get flanges, um, like you can purchase them individually, but again, a lot of your uh, double electric pumps typically are gonna come with um, two kind of fits initially. So that's something to look for when you're buying a pump. Okay. So now we're going to move to the early days of breastfeeding, um, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Shelly, who um, is going to talk about uh, feeding cues. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much, Oakdale, for inviting me to do this webinar with you. It is um, a blessing. Um, and I'm going to go back here. We'll go right back to the skin to skin here. And so um, the early days of breastfeeding. So we could go in and talk about so many different things, um, so many different tips and tricks. And um, a lot of them are very, very helpful, um, but we can't get to all of them today. So I'm picking the most important um, pieces to really focus on. And I hope this is very helpful for you to get a good start in the hospital. And um, I wanted to add too, that um, with the pumps that Bethany was talking about, the baby Buddha and the mom cozy and the Zami are all very good pumps on the market as well. Um, so just a little bit more brand new stuff always coming out. So it's always good to update it. Um, so for skin to skin, um, so right after delivery, um, having your baby skin to skin on your chest, um, not only will warm your baby, but it will actually help start and jumpstart your body to produce hormones to help make milk. It um, really promotes all those instincts for breastfeeding. Um, this is that place, that's where it all happens. And so we just have to kind of encourage all the instincts that kind of come alive with that. So babies are born with instincts um, to suck when there is something on the roof of their mouth or turn their cheek a certain way if um, something is touching it or um, do the crawl reflex, which yes, they actually crawl on their bellies on mom's chest to find the breast and to nurse. So um, getting that skin to skin contact is really um, babies um, kind of reset button. Like, yep, I'm looking for food now. And it's super comforting for baby. So if your baby is fussy or having gas or anything, you can um, place skin to skin, do a little bouncing, little burping at the same time, and it helps soothe them. And the, um, it doesn't always have to be this way, but for for partners, it can be super helpful to have um, them hold baby skin to skin too, to just kind of calm and soothe if you're needing a break or um, trying to rest a little bit in between feedings. It doesn't have that breastfeeding effect, but definitely can help. So let's see if we can go next page. Okay. 
Okay. Um, so then with feeding cues, um, that's what you're going to watch for. Those are signs that you can see your baby showing you that they are ready to eat. So they'll be sucking on their hand, doing mouth motions or suck motions, sticking their tongue out, turning their head side to side um, and opening their mouth, um, kind of looking like a little baby bird uh, looking for some food. Um, so those are the early feeding cues. And even just as soon as they start to wake up from their nap and start stirring, that's the first sign that they're going to be ready to eat soon. So um, go ahead, go to the bathroom, get ready, um, and, and then bring baby to you skin to skin um, if they're not there already. And then um, fussing and crying is a late sign for feeding cues. And we want to try to feed before this happens. It's really hard to latch a baby that is crying um, for reasons that their tongue is actually in the back of their mouth or elevated. It's not um, ready to work on breastfeeding. So catching them earlier will be helpful for latching. And um, this goes into hand expression. And this is one of the best tricks that you can remember. I want you to really um, make sure that you get a good grasp at this. So um, looking at this now, and what this is, is just getting that milk out. So you can hand express and get your milk out to help your baby latch. This is super helpful just to give your baby a little bit more if um, feedings are maybe um, just starting to get going and not super excellent yet. Um, you can hand express to remove milk and prevent plugged milk ducts and treat plugged milk ducts engorgement and then also to increase milk supply. So the more milk you remove, the more milk you make. The colostrum, which is that first milk in the beginning that Bethany was talking about, yes, is super, super thick and concentrated, that liquid gold, um, and their baby's tummies are just so small. They only need a few drops to a teaspoon for each feeding for the first couple of days. So it's very, very small amounts each and every time. So as you can see on the diagram, you're just gonna hold your fingers about two, two and a half inches apart and you're gonna push back towards your chest wall and then squeeze and compress and then relax. It's not a pull and squeeze or rolling your fingers and stretching down. Uh, it's not quite like milking a cow. So um, just getting that right technique, it takes a little time, but it's definitely worth the effort. Um, if you can hand express before or after pumping, it can really boost your supply about 48%. Um, it's just a different motion um, that is happening with the pump. It's more of like a vacuum and a pull where the hand expression is massaging more like your baby's mouth. So it can stimulate differently to tell your body to make more milk. So positioning, um, you know, there's so many things out there, you know, there's the breast friend pillow, there's the bobby pillow, there's um, different tricks that you're going to hear, even using like blankets to support yourself um, or a rolled up blanket to kind of go into the crevice of like a bobby pillow or something can be super helpful. Um, but going back to the basics again, like a laid back position, like after delivery, um, I'm going to bring my baby out here, <laughs> but you just kind of, you know, leaning back and having your baby skin to skin, and then you can let them kind of guide the way for where to go. But um, like she is in the picture, you can have them in more of like a cradle or a cross cradle hold. And as long as your baby is on their belly, then they can move and do that crawl reflex and find the breast. Um, when they're um, facing upward, you know, to the breast, it's really hard for them to um, feel comfortable and relaxed. It's almost like someone's going to move you or change your position and you're just not quite steady. So having that laid back position with them on their tummy, they really feel more secure and comfortable themselves. And then think about how you would like to drink. Um, you like to drink when your head and neck is nice and straight, right? You know, and we're not turning to the side to drink this way. Um, so you're straight and your head and neck is straight here. You don't have your chin to your chest. So make sure that your baby is positioned in a straight position, head and shoulders and hips and everything is nice and straight. And finding a position that you can kind of start your baby in where their nose is actually lined up to your nipple. And what that does is it allows them and encourages them to tip their head back and open up wide um, for a wider and deeper latch. 
And of course, facing the breast. Um, so at the level of the breast or over the breast. So then after you latch, if, you, if it's hard to latch, you know, laying down, you can sit up and latch and then just lean back and pull your baby over you. Um, and then just using any type of pillows or blankets, anything that you can to support yourself. You shouldn't have to be um, lifting your baby or holding your baby up. We want your shoulders and head and neck to be nice and relaxed. And um, I always try to tell moms too, it's good to take some deep breaths and relax. It's easier to let down your milk um, when that other milk comes in, when that happens. So yeah, get in a relaxed position. And then for a good latch, the good latch is so important. I mean, if we do not have a good latch, you're gonna be uncomfortable and baby's not gonna get enough to eat usually. Um, so the more that's in their mouth, the more milk that they'll get. Imagine if um, they latch on to just the nipple, um, right here, this is baby from baby's mouth <laughs> and we're latching on just to the nipple. You're kind they're kind of like pinching like the tip of like a straw, right? They're not really getting in what they need to get in. So um, baby should be opening wide the size of a yawn with their lips flipped out in opposite directions and then deep onto the areola, which is the circle and tissue around your nipple. Um, and it should be comfortable. It is sometimes uncomfortable the first, you know, few days as you're getting going because you haven't had baby sucking on your breast before um, and things change, um, especially with your first baby, your nipples do get longer and elongate um, so that when that happens, it can be a little bit sore, but it shouldn't be painful and you especially shouldn't have any cracks or blisters or bleeding or anything like that. Okay. So um, definitely get help if that's what's going on. But um, what you can do is break the suction by putting your finger into the baby's corner of your, of their mouth any finger that you can reach. Um, so it could be any of them. And if you're holding your breast, um, which is sometimes helpful just to kind of guide them to you, um, you can use any finger you find. Um, <laughs> but to get a good latch, it can help be helpful, like I was saying, to kind of squeeze your breast. And what you're going to do is squeeze it the shape of baby's mouth this way. So it's more like this like as if you were going to have a sandwich and take a big <laughs> wide bite, but um, so then your baby will just be, you know, you're kind of here with your big wide, we're waiting for that wide mouth, you know, tickling their nose and lips almost with your nipple. It sounds like a weird word, but touching it, whatever works for you. And then waiting for that wide mouth. And then when they're opening wide, um, then placing your breast more on top of their tongue instead of directly in the middle of their tongue um, as they need to stick their tongue out to pull the breast into their mouth and get that function going. Um, so, yeah, if, make sure to write down your questions if you have any. There's lots of different tips out there. Um, you might hear of an asymmetric latch and that is super helpful as well. Um, every baby's a little bit different with that, but they can be pretty quick. They can shut their mouth pretty quick. So if they're not opening wide, then um, just unlatch and then relatch. And if they're getting kind of fussy, you can hand express and even give a couple drops on your clean finger just to let them suck on your finger with your finger upside down and your in their mouth just to calm them and soothe them and take a break for yourself and then try again um, or even just stop and walk around the room and um, do some soothing right rocking walking bouncing those kind of things So feeding on demand with their feeding cues is just so important. So um, what it does is it acts like the demand on your body, and then that will give you the supply that you need for your milk later. And so that's how your baby will get enough to eat. So they demand what they want, and then your body will make what it needs. So it really helps build a really great um, milk supply. And for... Um, Early and frequent removal of milk is always the best stimulation for turning the factory on. I say it turns on the lights, everything gets going. Um, everything is kind of there and prepped and ready to go, but nothing is on. <laughs> so um, that early and frequent removal of milk, especially in the first two days, is so important for how much milk you'll have months and months later. So if your baby is not nursing well, um, 
right after birth, which sometimes does happen um, if your baby is premature or small, or if they're just a little bit worn out from labor and delivery, um, rest assured, you know, and you might be a little bit tired too sometimes. And so um, doing that skin to skin and hand express and giving drops or um, starting to pump to initiate that um, factory, right? Getting that factory going will help encourage a good milk supply. So babies um, eat at least eight times in 24 hours. And in the beginning, it's usually more like the 10 to 12 times a day in 24 hours and very frequently at times. And that's um, usually what we call cluster feeding. So when a whole bunch of feedings are kind of pushed and shoved together, you know, just within a small, short period of time. Um, and then sometimes they'll take like a two, three hour, five hour break, and then they'll go back at it again. Um, sometimes it'll seem like you're just constantly feeding them. And that is normal, especially in the first three days. Um, that helps build your milk supply. And it's actually um, somewhat of a good sign, um, usually that your milk is on its way in. So um, just kind of Go with the flow, keep feeding. Um, and if you've fed really well, you know, you can try doing some soothing techniques um, for a couple minutes. Uh, they'll start to cue more if they're still hungry, but when in doubt, feed your baby. And um, also burping is super helpful. Um, babies that are breastfed don't always burp as much as babies who are bottle fed, but they do still accidentally swallow air. And when that happens, it fills up their belly and they, they're not hungry anymore. So when in doubt, try burping or for soothing. And then hand express or pump if you're having problems and move on to the next slide here. And so for, um, So for um, breast and nipple care, um, something that's really important to know is that your baby is very instinctively driven um, and their sense of smell is very important for them to find the breast and to be interested in breastfeeding and to even realize that that's their mom. Um, so um, finding a way to just protect that area um, from other smells that could be um, making your baby maybe not as interested, you know, like smelly deodorants or soaps or lotions, just kind of keep away from the breast. Um, and then when you are showering or bathing, just try not to use a lot of soap on your breast and nipples themselves. Just let the soap run down from your shampoo or wherever, you know, you're, you're doing that. So it's not drying them out excessively, but your milk is actually very um, moisturizing and has antibodies in it to help it heal and protect. Um, allowing your breast to dry after breastfeeding is very important, like what Bethany said, um, and changing those pads frequently when wet, um, as often as you would for like a period or at least every feeding, you know, it's kind of like the same as those period pads. Um, and, you know, because of that soreness in the beginning when your baby's first learning and you haven't been used to having a baby breastfeed, um, there are some creams that are safe that you can put on afterwards. Um, you can do your milk first, let that dry, and then put on like a natural organic um, nipple cream to help that feel a little bit better. But again, if you are having ongoing pain or soreness or cracks, blisters, bleeding, um, that's something to follow up with. And then um, your nipples should be nice and round after the feeding as well. So it's not pinched or flattened or misshaped in any way. Um, so that, that that's how you know you're getting a good latch. So um, we talked about supportive bras. I like to just add, just not too tight. If they're too tight, they're gonna be causing restriction. And um, then that promotes plug ducts and other problems if that doesn't get relieved. Um, there are some lumps here and there in the very beginning. Um, usually they kind of go away by two weeks. So your milk comes in on day three to day five, and then your milk is really trying to regulate and get to a good level for your baby um, by supply and demand and by doing feeding on cue. And so then around two weeks, it starts to kind of level out and it gets a lot better. And so um, those kind of lumps that were there, maybe from a little bit of engorgement um, should be going away. But if there's any persistent lumps or anything, follow up with your provider. 
and um, engorgement. So when your milk comes in on day three to day five, it's not necessarily just your milk. Your body is um, a little bit stunned that there's milk in your breast, and sometimes there's swelling that comes along with that. And so the swelling can kind of hold up your milk a little bit and make it um, even more hard and uncomfortable. And then it's hard to get the milk out. It can be hard to breastfeed if your breasts are hard like a rock. Um, you want to soften your breasts so that you can squeeze your breast and get more in your baby's mouth. Um, and then it'll be easier to pump, easier to hand express and all these things. So um, to prevent any engorgement, you wanna do frequent pumping and breastfeeding um, often so that you're not getting engorged. But if you are getting engorged around this time, then one thing that's super helpful is moving the swelling just kind of away towards your armpit. So you're moving it away from your nipple in all different directions. Sorry, you can't see me. <laughs> like a rays of the sun, you know, going out in all different directions around your nipple and then up towards your armpit, moves that swelling into your lymph nodes. And then you have room for the milk to kind of come down and out. Um, other things that help help are doing the hand expression in different directions around your areola to clear the milk ducts all the way around. And then also to um, do some reverse pressure, which is just like putting pressure um, on each side of the nipple with your fingers any way you can um, just to soften it. And you just kind of hold that for a few seconds, just right around your nipple. And that just moves the swelling away so that um, the, the milk will come out when you hand express, which will help with latching, and then you can squeeze your breast and get more into baby's mouth. And um, cold packs and cabbage leaves, um, believe it or not, are actually super helpful for engorgement. You probably saw that right away on the slide thinking, what is she talking about? Um, this is something that has been known for a long, long time, um, but it does decrease inflammation and um, works tremendously well. So um, cold packs um, and cabbage leaves, they can stay on for um, 20 minutes or so after a feeding or before a feeding, either way is okay. Um, just you would take off the cabbage as soon as you start to get soft. Some women are a little bit hesitant because they've heard that cabbage leaves are used for weaning and that is true. But again, for the same reason that it helps with um, that swelling and um, discomfort from the swelling and inflammation from trying to wean. Um, so it is okay to do while you are engorged in those first few weeks too. And so um, plug milk ducts, we wanna prevent those too. So um, of course, like just like the preventing the engorgement, you know, you wanna feed um, frequently. So sometimes these plug ducts can kind of sneak up on us when we're least expecting them. Like um, after a whole bunch of cluster feeding from a growth spurt, then baby stops doing the cluster feeding and then they just feed as they were before. And then your breast did increase in a volume and in supply during that time. And then all of a sudden you're fuller all the time. And so if that milk doesn't get relieved or especially if you're hard and uncomfortable, that's when it's gonna um, cause more of a problem for ongoing plug duct. So you want to um, do that either feed baby more or hand express or pump to relieve that firmness. Um, and then with baby, like with for sleeping for longer periods at night, you know, that can kind of come on as a surprise and a very nice surprise at times, but your body doesn't know that. And <laughs> so then you wake up really hard and uncomfortable if you're not leaking, some women leak, some don't very much. Um, I say sometimes when you are leaking, it's a blessing for that reason. <laughs> But um, when pumping is initiated, it also can be something different on the breast. So anything that is different with your routine or on your breast is going to um, be a little bit of a risk for just a plug duct. So just know of that. And it's just because um, the pump might remove differently than the baby does or remove more or quickly or faster and your body just responds to that. So there could be a difference in your breasts. So that's a, a, one of the best ways to know too is just to learn your body, learn your breasts, assess your breasts before 
during and after a feeding or a pumping. And that sounds so silly and hard to think of, but um, once you get going with it, you'll understand why. Um, you know, you'll want to check over here if baby's nursing. And oftentimes, plug ducts are right um, above your nipple and areola and then into the armpit. Um, so you can massage, use warm compress. Uh, you're going to rotate different breastfeeding positions um, to get that milk removed. Milk is removed from by the nose and by the chin. Um, so if baby is positioned differently on the breast, like in a football versus a cross cradle or um, in more of a laid back position, that's going to help remove milk better as well as hand expression. And how to know if your baby is getting enough, right? You want the appropriate dirty and wet diapers, hearing good swallowing while breastfeeding and feeling that fullness before the feeding and softer afterwards, knowing that your baby is satisfied and content. Um, your appointments with the pediatrician, um, your baby's provider will be super helpful to know. It is normal actually to lose some weight in the beginning for the first few days. And then they typically regain that birth weight by 14 days. And then we kind of talked already about when to pump, but uh, also like if your baby is not nursing well or having an illness, you'll want to take out that pump and do a little bit after the feeding if you're feeling like you're not empty or if you're having any uncomfortable firmness. Um, and then to help boost supply, which is always good to have um, some guidance with that. And when to introduce a bottle, unless it's medically necessary, it is best to wait the three to four weeks old um, to allow breastfeeding to get well established so that they can learn how to suck and swallow and coordinate at the breast. It is very different than a bottle. And um, after the three to four weeks, it, a one bottle a day can be very helpful to keep that up so that mom can have a break, um, uh, the partner can have time to enjoy baby, and then they become familiar with the bottle and it isn't a problem later when they have to leave their baby. Using a slow flow nipple and a paste bottle feeding technique is more like breastfeeding. And that is um, found on our blog too. Um, returning to work, you'll wanna pump as often as you were breastfeeding, at least every three to four hours. And you wanna avoid the firmness in your breast. It is required by law to provide space and time for pumping. Um, some tips here are packing the day before, staying hydrated, having easy snacks to just grab right away, and then um, finding like ways that you can clean your pump parts and store them easily where you are at your workplace. It's just a different setting every place. You have to find out what works for you. And so if you're concerned you don't have enough milk, um, get some expert guidance. Um, just because of your history or the actual specific situation that you're in might require a different plan than what you're seeing online or you've heard from friends. Um, here are some general basics for increasing milk supply, you know, feeding or pumping more often, massaging, hand expression, um, the foods that even Bethany had talked about, sweet potatoes, eggs, whole grains, leafy greens, uh, flaxseed and barley are pretty huge and hydration. And then waiting to see um, results, you're not gonna see them right away. You need to do things consistently for at least three to four days to see that daily total of pump volume increase. Um, family and friends support. This is so important to Bethany and I, and we know that it takes a village um, to raise a baby. And so knowing who your support people are and counting on them um, and knowing the ones that are maybe not as supportive, maybe not talking about feedings with them or changing the subject when, when they do start talking about it, a baby is a really great um, distraction. <laughs> so you can always divert back to your baby, um, but finding good people um, that maybe someone that you know and um, attending the breastfeeding support groups they're free they're super fun to see other moms and babies um, you'll see different babies of different milestones you know you might see a third three month old a six month old nine month old newborn and they all have great tips so it's fun to see all that stuff and it's parenting stuff too not just breastfeeding um, and then never turn down any help. Um, you'll be surprised at how willing neighbors and coworkers will be willing to chip in and lend a hand if they need it. Um, there's also um, postpartum groups online at ppsupport.org. 
So um, definitely seek help if you're wondering how weight, weight and growth is going, latching and breastfeeding, any questions about supply or if you're having pain at all, um, reach out to us or if there's a big transition coming up, um, then we're here for you. And again, this is what Wellspring does. Um, in-home and breastfeeding support groups, virtual consults. We do free prenatal consults as well. And then all of our services do include follow-up um, messaging and phone calls. You guys went through a lot of information. That's awesome. <laughs> I love that happy baby though at the end. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, we do have a lot of questions. So I thought I would just get right to it. Does that sound okay? Yeah. Um, is it best to get a new pump for each baby or it can be reused if it still seems like it's in good condition? That's a great question. Um, I, to be honest, you can use the same pump that you did for previous babies. That is completely fine. Uh, sometimes if people, maybe if it's been, I don't know, five, six years since you had a baby. A lot of times, like I said, I'm always a big proponent of checking with insurance to see if they will cover one for you. Um, sometimes like I said, or if you had issues maybe with using a pump with your, maybe your first baby and you want to try a different one, but otherwise there's no issues in um, using the same pump. Great. And how long does breast milk last keep after, um, after you've been, it's been pumped? Good question. Um, so that is, yeah, when it's freshly pumped, it's good for at least four hours. Um, there's some information that says longer, but that's the safe amount for about four hours after when you're, when it's fresh and then in the refrigerator for four days and then the freezer for about four months or so, um, four to six months, depending on your deep freeze. And then, um, once it's thawed, it's only good for 24 hours. And then if you put, um, warmed up breast milk in a bottle, if it goes to baby's mouth, it's all good for about two hours. All right. Just remember the rule of fours. That's what I always say. Like, you know, four, four hours in the, you know, room temperature, four days in the fridge, four months in the freezer, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Good tip. Um, would you recommend bringing flanges from purchased pump to the hospital and asking the nurse lactation consultant to point out which is the best fit? Seems like a great idea. It doesn't hurt. Well, Shelly, you've been in the hospital. Yeah, that's yeah. That's a great idea. <laughs> yeah, been there and helped with that. It's definitely helpful, I think, but um, just keep in mind that over the course of pumping, your nipples do enlarge. So that size might change later. Um, so we just never know. What, you know what I mean? Like, it's always good to have it assessed and looked at um, um, if you're in question or if you're having pain. Right. Um, any tips for breastfeeding with inverted nipples? And so, um, there are lots of different things that you can do for inverted nipples. It would definitely depend on, um, the, the exact, um, depth of the inversion and, um, what we're seeing and how baby is responding to latching. If it, if your nipple everts after, um, some pressure next to the nipple, or if it's not, um, and you don't want to pump when you're pregnant, um, necessarily, but you do want, you can just follow up with a lactation consultant prenatally. Like if we do the free prenatal consults and we can kind of check to see how things are going and give you more of a specific plan. All right. Um, one, one attendee asked, how do you prevent and treat clogged ducts? But it seems like you address that. Um, is there anything else you wanted to add? The only thing I would say is that if you're kind of to Shelly's point earlier too, if you are, if you are persistently having clogged ducts or you're like, gosh, this lump has been persistent, that's when I actually say you want to come in and be assessed just to see what's going on and make sure that it is indeed um, a clogged duct. You know, very rare cases we can see sometimes some abscess and things like that. So um, if you're, if you're, you know, try the tips that, um, that Shelly was mentioning, kind of the frequent pumping, um, you know, doing the, the hand expression, the breast massage, all of those things to try and prevent the, um, clogged ducts and you're still having issues. I would, I would come in just to, just to make sure everything's okay. All right. If you're producing milk prior to baby's arrival, should you be pumping or collecting milk? 
And if you don't, will your supply diminish versus if you wait for baby to arrive? Um, so your supply, sorry, <laughs> your supply will not diminish if you stop. Um, at, as soon as that placenta is delivered, that's when the hormones really kick in for more milk production. And that's when the skin to skin and breastfeeding is most important. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll revert that to Bethany for. We, we don't pumping when you're pregnant. And that is because, um, it can actually, so your body produces oxytocin when you are breastfeeding or when you're pumping that, that, that is stimulation and oxytocin, uh, is what also can cause that uterus to really, um, nipple stimulation is something that we'll, we'll use sometimes as we get close to that delivery day, if we're trying to help maybe get contractions going, but we don't want to have that. Um, we don't want extra nipple stimulation, um, prior to that point or prior to delivery, because again, that could cause that uterus to contract. So the good news is you have a good milk supply already um, starting and it, it, some people just leak that milk early on, but I also don't want people to think if they don't leak milk, that that means that they can't breastfeed or that they don't have a milk supply. That's not true either. Everybody's a little bit different. Some people um, have noticed a lot of leaking of milk prior to delivery and other people don't notice anything and both are totally normal. But no, you don't need to pump ahead of time. Yay, one well, less thing you have to do. <laughs> what is the purpose of nipple shields? So nipple shields are used for persistent difficulty with latch. Um, it's not intended to be a go-to right away, right? You know, sometimes babies need some time and some practice to kind of get going with their latching. Um, it can help baby latch on deeper and create a better suction around the breast. Sometimes they're used more for inverted or um, flatter nipples if they're not everting out very far. Right. Can you talk a little about tongue lip ties and how they may affect proper latch? How often does this occur and how easily is it diagnosed to help with feedings? So that is a very hot topic, um, very hot and common topic. So you're at like, everyone's talking about it right now and in their varying um, opinions on that. So it is a little hard to answer. Um, they can be assessed, um, although it isn't in my um, scope or practice either to diagnose it, we can still see them and know of them and still help um, provide the plan of care that you need or to refer as needed. Um, if they do, um, the lip is supposed to be flipped out during the latch um, and that helps create suction, which helps create or the seal, right? It creates the seal around the lips on the breast and then that helps create the good suction so the baby can get enough milk. Um, sometimes they'll do more biting if they don't have um, that lip flipped all the way out. And then um, with the tongue, the tongue's job is to extend and lift and bring the breast into their mouth. And if they can't um, move their tongue well, then they can't do that great motion, which provides the good suction and good coordination for good, efficient swallowing. And there also can be um, buckle ties, um, cheek ties. And another word that you might hear out there is tots, tethered oral tissues. Um, so there are ways to assess and to help with that. There is um, some training that can be done for the baby and also positioning tips and tricks for mom. Um, and then we look at how the functioning is of breastfeeding alone, not just on what we see. Okay. So how many times are you having to refer to out of curiosity to have that corrected, like to have mm -hmm. a tongue tie surgery, would you say just on average? That's a really hard question to answer just because, um, we are seeing moms, right. Mm -hmm. When they are needing lots of help. Right. So they're already having trouble breastfeeding. So we feel like we see a lot of them, um, which maybe that means that all the other <laughs> easier problems are getting solved ahead of time. But um, it really just depends. And um, some some need to be revised and some don't. Um, but 
it just, it depends on the function of the tongue and the function of the whole mouth itself with breastfeeding. There's lots of variables, um, including supply and how fast the flow is and um, how strong baby is and their personality even <laughs> for how strong they want to nurse. Sure. If breastfeeding, when should I add a short pump session after feeding? And so it depends on what the goal is. If it's for increasing milk supply, you know, that can be done after any of the feedings. Um, if you're thinking that you have a supply issue, definitely follow up so that we can guide you more closely to, to determine how long and for how much and to assess if your supply is getting better. But um, if you're just trying to collect some milk to go back to work, you can pump for a few minutes after the first feeding in the morning when you're a little bit fuller, and then that will help you store that away or after one or two other feedings throughout the day. And it's good to know that you can combine like milk from one pumping session to another. So um, just so you know, you can, if you pump twice a day, you can kind of add, even if you're just pumping for a few minutes, you know, five minutes, you know, twice a day, um, you can combine that milk together, so. Mm -hmm. We got an email um, from an attendee who was wondering about just words of encouragement. Um, she just needed, she's been having problems with latch with her newborn and just wanted, wanted to know, um, you know, it's easy to get frustrated, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so how long should you wait and, and how do you deal with that frustration? I'm sorry to hear that it is super frustrating at times. I understand um, and see it a lot and uh, was a mom that was frustrated once upon a time <laughs> um, a long time ago. Now my kids are almost teenagers. So I think that, um, you know, every little situation is different. So we really want to hear your whole story, um, really learn what your goals are. And sometimes they change along the way. Um, one thing that helps is that you know, you're making short-term goals and not long-term goals. We're not gonna be able to uh, accomplish um, you know, a wonderful latch and a great supply if there's lots of problems coming into it. Um, it does take time and patience, which is hard when you're very sleepy and you're very tired and pumping does not sound very fun, but really close follow-up is so important so that you are seeing those um, small successes along the way and that you're no, you're seeing that progress, right? It might not be perfect, um, but you're definitely making that progress and it can get, be perfect later. You know, we just have to kind of work at it. And some moms, it's only one consult that they need and then they are okay if there's tips and tricks and it was a relatively quick fix, but other things are a little bit longer. And so um, just knowing that that is normal too, and that you're not the only one out there that could be struggling. And I think the other thing I would add is just that just as we talk about as we prepare you for labor and delivery to kind of keep an open mind towards your birth experience. Mm -hmm. The same thing as I think sometimes with our breastfeeding experience and that goes from even baby to baby. Every baby is going to be a little bit different. And so having that support, having these like, you know, general tools in your tool bag, but also knowing like, okay, like I think sometimes I, I had, I had one mom that her whole goal was just to be able um, to nurse and she just wanted to breastfeed. She didn't even really want to pump. And then of course her baby struggled with latching on. And so she had to just switch her whole mindset and she was able to exclusively pump and give baby that breast milk, but it was a little bit of having to grieve that, like that loss, but also to be like, okay, but I'm still, what is the goal? I really wanted to be able to give my baby breast milk. So I'm still able to do that. I'm still able to give that baby breast milk, um, even if it doesn't look like the way that I thought it was going to look. Um, same thing. Sometimes we have a baby that's born prematurely, right? And, and we weren't anticipating that. And so um, just kind of being able to shift gears and focus on, as Shelly was saying, those short-term goals and what is our goal. And, and obviously we want a healthy baby and a healthy mom. And, um, and sometimes we do it to kind of shift um, how we get to that point. But um, mm -hmm. again, just getting that support and knowing that we're here for you. And like Shelly said, um, yeah, we want to hear your whole story. And sometimes that, that takes time um, and it can be frustrating, but we want to just partner with you. In, so, mm -hmm. yeah. And 
um, just to kind of, you know, remember, you know, it's all about that love, right? You're just kind of loving your baby and you can still give that love and comfort and support um, skin to skin and interacting with your baby as well. Um, But it's not an easy thing to to go through, um, but we understand that um, sometimes it is a little grieving and that expectation that Bethany was saying is, is a good tip. All right, All right last question um, uh, via email, wondering about some good apps you might recommend for diaper changing, feedings, that type of thing, something that you, that you like. Shelly, you had some good ones. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Um, I usually hear really good things about Baby Tracker or Baby Connect, but there are so many different ones out there. So sometimes that is helpful to kind of look through and get familiar with the app um, before baby comes a little bit, just so when you're tired and exhausted or if you're trying to teach your partner how to use it, then you got it down. Okay. We talked about having the ability for more than one person to be able to oh, view and track yeah. and log that, which I think is important, especially with other caregivers. Um, Oakdale does have a, um, a free pregnancy um, app, Yo Mingo, that I think some of you probably have, and there is some um, there is a tracking app on that as well. Uh, I was just saying I'm not as familiar with it just because that specific component of it, but I think other people can also view that as well. So that would be another option for you too. Excellent. All right. Well, that's it for the questions. Is there anything else that um, you want to add as we kind of bring this to a close? Well, I'm just super grateful that um, you guys all joined in and Shelly, thank you for just your expertise and your um, willingness to share with us as well. And my big thing is, is get help you know, seek help out if things aren't going well. Um, there are resources available and we want to be able to, we want to be able to help you in this breastfeeding journey. Thank Excellent. you so much, Bethany. Thank you, Shelly. Thank you, Bethany. Thanks. Have everyone. a good night. Thanks so yes. much. Take care. Thanks, Andy. Bye-bye.